you very much. It's clear that it's a great pleasure to be back here, in particular despite the mask. It's very good to see familiar faces. So my natural intelligence sim still recognizes these faces even with masks. So it's very good. And of course, it raises nice and very good memories. All right, but now we are in the present. And uh, you may expect me to first make some comments on the title. I won't, because it will explain itself in, in a few minutes. And uh, I hope so in an entertaining way. This is a brief look at the contents. Again, I will skip over most of it and start with something that you may not expect. Do we need still? Do we need? Is that on? Do you hear me up there? No. Jesus Christ. No, it's dead. Maybe I should shout more. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, that's okay. So let's shout along. Okay, do we need still artists? Why I'm raising this question? Well, you'll see it on the next slide. And I take the opportunity to make some PR for my son. He's a senior architect, so these people consider themselves as artists. But he is also a fan of artificial intelligence. And uh, so he is now into painting, but the type of paintbrush is very modern. What you see is a paintbrush. This one is a modern paintbrush, a script. And that script gives you some verbal prompts. And it says, for instance, uh, the type of a portrait you would like to paint, a mysterious bounty hunter with opaque visor. Then you say this picture should be inspired by Beksinski. And it has a lot of question, uh, exclamation marks, because this inspiration should be strong. It should be also inspired a little bit by Möbius, and so on and so on. And it describes in a verbal way the scene you should, uh, that should be created. And then the artificial intelligence kicks out. And uh, Jesus. Open. And uh, maybe I have to close. No, no, I should go back. Ah, yes, but here is what it does. And this is what the, what the algorithm produces. Well, why I'm showing this? Not just because of PR. Because behind it is a type of algorithm that will pop up later in a completely different context. So some of my talk will be about the principles behind this kind of algorithm. It's called generative adversarial network. Generative means you create a network that parses through a huge database and makes proposals that are being controlled by an adversarial network that makes sure that your target criteria are met. So in, in, in this case, a very crude way of a metric uh, created by these verbal prompts. And what you get are, of course, faces that never exist. So these people uh, don't, don't exist. But the principle is important. There is another one which uh, already reflects a little bit the way how these are generated. This is a very hypey subject. You see a lot of activities like this. But what you see here is an initial density, probability density, which is gradually transformed into your target density. And the principle is to go from low resolution to high resolution and creep your way around this universe of density functions. And in this case, uh, you could see that there is a, a Japanese artist which has much more inspiration on this. But it's, it's like a nested refinement. OK, so let's maybe stop with this. And skip this. So we go back to the full screen. Right. 
so this is one reason why deep learning is so fascinating, why it attracts so many people, and why it is kind of having even transformative effect on the society, through social media and other things. This is where there is an undisputable, stunning success. Of course, creative young scientists then start asking, well, can we use that also for our purposes? Science is such a rich field, and for sure we have to learn from data. So what is the role of deep learning in science? As soon as you ask that question, you are in the middle of a dispute, and that's the dispute. So on the right-hand side is the deep learner, the cool guy who attracts everybody's interest, so his creativity, but also a little bit of sloppiness. He plows away and comes up with interesting ideas and transforms them, and so on and so on. And then there is this nagging pedant pedant or stickler. Let's call him the stickler, who is never satisfied. He says, no, 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 it's not going to work. I mean, how, how can you do that? And this is impossible. Terrible. OK, why is this related to this talk? Because you could identify this guy with predictive science, who really has to make sure that the result is accurate in some way that you can rely on it. And the deep learner, well, he is at peace with it. He smokes a cigar. And let's see, it says, for the bilingual people or multilingual people here, it is not emoyote, Jan. OK, so what I, this talk is about that dispute between the two. And I invite you to kind of participate in that dispute. So I'm not going to bombard you with any gallery of pictures that show great success of deep learning. Because most of the time, there isn't, not in scientific applications. But it is more about the reasons why there are obstructions and maybe mathematical pathways to remedy them. So it's more or less a discussion of a roadmap between the two. Of course, the stickler is now playing my role. So this is an uncool role, I have to admit. But, but anyway, I, I like to rub skin with, in this case, with the deep learner. Okay? Let's see what they, what they come up to. To put this discussion into a scientific framework, let's look at a scenario that is ubiquitous in, in, in engineering and in, in, in science. What you have is two sources of information, namely data, observations, measurements. At the same time, you have some physical governing law, which is a model, a physical model. And the point is then to, to draw from these two sources the best kind of synthesizing in, information on the state of interest you you try to study. And it should be clear from the very beginning to everybody, the big success of deep learning is in a big data scenario, where you have an abundance of data to tweak your algorithm. In science, you are never in this scenario. You are always in a small data scenario, because measurements, those who really reflect on the physical state, are always too few. And the processes you would like to understand are always too many. So the model plays a tremendous role. In Big data scenarios, your model is a stochastic model. You are sampling from a density, and that's, that's it. Okay. So here are a couple of examples that, that set the stage and, and, and also the notation. So here is a classical cartoonish representation of porous media flow. You are standing, can that be seen? No. Yeah, okay. You are standing on top of the surface, and there is a fluid creeping below your feet, but you can't see the structure. You would like to predict it, like a pollutant, for instance. And all you can take some measurements in, in pressure heads. So you have boreholes, and you measure the water level. And this is your information. But the information is also that the, the flow is subject to a physical law. And that physical law, in this case, the simplest version is Darcy's law, where, you, where u is the pressure now, to satisfy the second order diffusive equation. Now, you don't know that structure. So you model the structure by permeability conditions, uh, co coefficients that may depend on parameters. And, and these parameters may pass through a, a parameter domain so as to capture the possible states that you are observing. Okay. So the solutions of this equation, there's not just one solution. But for each parameter, you get another solution. You get a solution field. And mathematically speaking, this is the object of interest, namely the collection of all solutions to this equation if you traverse the parameter domain, which could be 100 dimensional, could be infinite dimensional. 
because in some cases, these expansions and these parameters come through a Kahun and Loew expansion, which is a Fourier expansion, and has un infinitely many, many ways. Okay? Now, as a, so there is no one solution. There is a family of solutions sitting in the solution manifold, and each individual entry is a function that depends on space and time. So I always, I neglect time here. So this is a stationary problem, but it works for time as well, of course, and also on the parameters. So if you have 100 parameters to play with, this could be a function of 103 variables. So now you are trying to recover a function of 103 variables from a couple of measurements. And everybody should know that when you go into this, you should know from the very beginning that you're walking on very thin ice. All right? OK. Here's another example, which shortage of time, I don't know. It's electron microscopy. It seems a completely different scenario. In fact, the modeling equation behind it, in this case, is a Schrodinger equation. So it's not just diffusive equations. It's a Schrodinger equation, which means wave propagation. And there are numerous other examples where you have also nonlinear problems, of course. So let's not stick with it. I just want to show there's a, a universe of applications which are of that category. And each time, you have to deal with this issue of recovering an object which depends possibly on many, many variables. And so you have to make best use of, of, of the information. So I have already alluded at the intrinsic obstructions you meet in such a, such a thing. And again, I, will, I won't go into a specific problem and show you examples. This is about the basic concepts you may have to take into account when, when, when doing this. And here is, of course, the word that pops in when you try to recover functions of many variables, the curse of dimensionality. So what does it mean? Some people, even established people, as I recently learned, think the curse of dimensionality has to do with solving huge systems of equations. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with approximating functions of many variables. And that's an entirely different thing. And here is a classical result. As it goes back to Novak Wojnikowski, is about probably 20 years old. And it says if you try to recover a function that lives on a, on a cube in d dimensions, it's very smooth. It has infinitely many de um, de uh, derivatives, which is usually a sign of good approximability. And even if these derivatives are all less than or equal to 1, so they're all strictly bounded, the amount of work or information you need to recover such a function at epsilon accuracy is epsilon to the minus d. This is the curse of dimensionality. It means your work scales exponentially in the number of variables not in the size of the discrete problem, in the number of variables. So what does it mean? Smoothness or regularity doesn't help in high dimensions. So all what you have learned in low in continuum mechanics, oh, it's 10 times differentiable, oh, well, high order splines work very well, or high order finite elements work very well. This doesn't play any role anymore. You are looking, you have to look for something else that replaces smoothness. And in the current framework, what we are looking at in these models, which depend, which are in high parameter uh, dimensionality regimes, you are even hit in a, in, a, in a more serious way by this because the information you have is also very skinny. Few boreholes, few electrons in electron impedance tomography around your body from which you would like to infer the morphology of your interior in terms of a conduction field or something like this. The same type of, uh, type of problem. So there's a severe undersampling. So in the end, you are ending up with still post-inversion problems. And one of the big obstructions in this is this curse of dimensionality, because, because you need, it questions the, the, the type of observation or information you need in order to do a, a reasonable recovery job. Well, this is where, behind the scene, the interest in reduced modeling is specific. And what I'm going to talk about has to do with reduced models. And I would like to water it down in order not to go into technical details to the following core task. So you remember there is this solution manifold, which, which consists of solutions to this PDE, which I write in residual form, and which depends on parameters y 
and this is a PDE, and you go for the solution, and you are willing to vary y over a high dimensional parameter space. Okay. So for each y, you get a solution which depends on y. And this mapping, often called as the parameter to solution map, that basically encodes your information on that model. So if you want to explore the solution manifold efficiently, you better have a representation of this mapping which you can quickly evaluate. That's what reduced bases try to do, where each evaluation is solving a low-dimensional system of equations. But this is it. So can you have a parameterized, a parameterized representation, sorry, a parameterized representation of this mapping so that approximates this function of x and but then the question is, what kind of format should you use? Oh, the one, one likes beast lines, the other one likes wavelets, the other one likes finite elements, the other one likes f uh, radial basis function or mesh lab methods. So which animal in the zoo do you want to take? Well, here are three basic formats yeah, that, that may come to mind. The first one is maybe the, the most traditional one. Uh, you have a collection of basis functions, phi j. They depend on x and y. And you can look at superpositions with unknown coefficients theta j. These are the trainable parameters here. So once you have fixed them, you may have a good approximation. Well, you may have basis functions, actually an infinite collection of basis functions, like wavelets with a full basis. So this is like a dictionary. And then you may select only finally many, one, many of those from such a dictionary to do a good job in approximating this function. A more nonlinear version is, um, say, a low rank approximation. Where you use where you separate variables, so you take products of factors that depend only on fewer variables, and maybe you can even factorize these, these uh, in, in in the high dimensional uh, parameter as well. So we have many 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 factors. So many for some problems this works very well. It it it, it is much better. Could, it could be much better than this one. It's also more nonlinear, because to create an approximation like this, you have a kind of a square nonlinearity. You have to you have to find the representation in such products. They are not pre-selected. So you have to develop them in the course of an algorithm. That's more difficult, and your gain is better. And then there is a yet another format, which is more nonlinear. And this is written here. And what is this? I think everybody is familiar with the notion of a composition. So you can suppose you have a linear function. And you apply to it another linear function, which in this case is matrix multiplication. You get, you get a new function, which in this case is still linear. But here you compose more general mappings. Each of those mappings has a simple form as an affine map. This is a matrix. You can apply a matrix to an input, high dimensional input variable, and you have an offset with a vector in that space, and then you apply a nonlinearity. If you the nonlinearity is important. If you don't apply nonlinearity, you just keep multiplying affine mappings, you get affine mappings. Okay? So to get something much richer, you need, you need nonlinearities. And you can think of hyperbolic tangent or ReLU or whatever. It doesn't matter for the purpose of that talk. But this is the structure. And then you compose and you try to approximate objects by this composition. It's totally different than the other. So the approximation properties of this is therefore following different rules. Anyways, these are, these are the animals that fascinate people nowadays in, in, in deep learning. And deep means the number of composition factors here. If the, if, if the number, the, like the level or the depth, is large, then you get a very, very nonlinear beast. So that should already indicate that it's not so easy to actually maneuver these, these objects and to do a good approximation job. And what, what would be the only way how to do it? In a, in, a, in a way, you can try to cook up an optimization problem over the parameters. So each layer depends on parameters. In this case, the parameters are the entries in the matrix and the entries in that vector. So they form these parameters. Each layer has them, and this makes the whole collection of parameters here. And you try to fit them in such a way that this object eventually will be a good approximation to this one. Why should it? Well, that's the next question. Why and when are such networks really reasonable? Okay? So everybody should ask that question first. Because why jumping on such a, 
on such a horse if you don't even know how to how to use the reins. Okay. Uh, here is some remarks on this. Okay, there are some pros, some pros, and the pros are for people who like the black box hammer for every problem, because it's kind of a unified way of atta attacking a problem. Namely, you reduce it to an optimization problem, and then you pick optimization software, and it will do the job for you. So it's a very unified, unifying uh, point of view. The second thing is because you have these compositions, you can benefit from the chain rule in analysis differentiation is f facilitated by the chain rule. So in optimization, you need gr typically gradient descent. So you can execute gradient calculations using this structure. So that's fine. That is tempting. Um, then people have tried to understand what kind of functions can you approximate with these deep neural networks. In fact, the answer is quite positive. Basically, everything that can be approximated by the other known classical methods. So if your favorite wavelet basis does a great job for this, neural networks can catch up. If your B-spline expansion does a good job, neural networks can catch up. Catch up. If uh, radial basis functions are OK, neural networks will catch up. They can, ca they can approximate holomorphic functions very well. They can even approximate fractals very well. So it's kind of a universal object. That's a pro. Well, as there's always another side of the coin, uh, you will know, and it can't be so good. Anyway, so there are some <laughs> negative objects. Whenever you stick this fellow into an objective function and try to minimize, you have a very, very non-convex problem. There's no guarantee of optimization success. In fact, you, you typically get stuck in, an optim in, in, in a local minimum. Perhaps you have many local minima. They are more or less about what you can get. But even there is no guarantee if you look at it really closely. Then you don't know what kind of sorry what kind of computational complexity you will actually need in order to find a reasonable minimum or a local minimum, and then there is what's called a theory to practice gap. There's an interesting recent work by actually a former student from Aachen, which is Felix Goblander, together with Philip Gross. They did an analysis of this and they showed that even though you can prove mathematically that you can have a certain approximation, high approximation rate for certain functions, you may not be able to achieve that approximation through optimization based on point factors. There is a, there's a break, okay? So there are all sorts of, of, of points of con consideration. And in the end, to me, this is the worst thing. Because the expressive power doesn't tell you anything about the accuracy you achieve, because you have to really realize the, uh, the optimum. And there's no way to guarantee that. So you don't have error estimates. And if you are in applications that are error tolerant, this is fine. Like imaging, producing pictures, that warrior, that ancient warrior, I mean, it could look different. You would say, oh, it's still, still a nice guy. I wouldn't like to meet him in the dark. But, but it, in error averse applications, and essentially all of you are involved in error averse applications where it matters how accurate your simulation is, it's a different question. So that's really the, dispute, the dispute uh, uh, that we will involve in. But again, if you see, OK, now the account, the account form of the previous slide is, whatever a classical method can do, the networks can do at about the same quality, about a little less, short by log factor. But about the same quality. However, you don't know whether you actually realize that uh, uh, through optimization. So there's, there's a disadvantage to established methods. And I think my colleagues from engineering can testify with many examples where this has been eventually observed by students as well. Okay? So there must be a plus. And to me, as a mathematician, the plus could be in scenarios where you can actually show Neural networks can do better than classical methods. And it's not even clear whether this exists. It should. Well, it does. OK, here's a, here's a, here's a kind of a, a model a scenario involving transport. Transport is not nice to reduce basis methods, which are very nice for diffusive problems, but not to reduce basis methods. 
So here the equation is a, a simple first order transport equation, but the convection field here that gives the directional derivative depends on parameters. And here the solution manifold is not smooth in, 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 in Y. Typically, not at all. It's like Lipschitz, but not holomorphic like in the elliptic case. It's a huge mathematical difference. So, and now you can wonder uh, how about approximations of solutions of points in the solution manifold now? And here's a theorem I don't even expect you to read in the detail. I, I, I explained to you what the theorem says. It says in the end, if the data in the problem, which means the convection field, the initial conditions, the right hand side, if these data have in some sense a good approximability by compositions, not by neural networks, by compositions, where the composition factors are nice, like Lipschitz, and have controllable norms. If this is true, then the solution also belongs to such an approximation class. So these are new approximation classes. I can give a whole lecture about this by itself. There's a paper who is interested in to you, but the, 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 the spirit of the theorem is if the data are kind of close to a composition in a quantifiable way, then the solution is close to a composition in a quantifiable way, and not only to a composition, but actually to a network. And you can find for every target a neural network that is approximates with an epsilon accuracy and has that many trainable parameters. These are the degrees of freedom. And what I would like to point out is here, there is no curse of dimensionality. In this case, the dimension, which the big dimension is the parameter dimension here, it doesn't affect the epsilon. It's only the spatial dimension, m, which is 1, 2, or 3. So the curse of dimensionality is not n. The, the, the parameter dimension only sits in the log and in, a, in an algebraic term with a power depending only on the spatial dimension plus time. So this is an example, and you can see it would be the best approximation rate for a Lipschitz function if it wasn't for this 1 plus alpha over alpha. So that alpha controls the approximability of the data. If alpha tends to infinity, then the approximability of the data gets better and better by compositions. And then this tends to 1. So you basically approach in the limit what you can do with functions of m plus 1 variables, which are Lipschitz. So this is, this is about what you, what, what, what you can do. Anyway, so this for a mathematician says, OK, OK, you, you, you should maybe look at it. This, these beasts can do something in, in certain applications where the classical methods can't. And uh, this was the earlier known result. You see epsilon to the minus m plus 1 plus dy, as opposed to that epsilon. The dy here is sitting fully there. That's the full curse of dimensionality exponential dimension for, for the previously known, uh, known, known result. All right, see, we are, we are progressing quickly, but the meat is in this last section, uh, I'm afraid. So it, this result says, OK, there's a chance. You can, you can break the curse of dimensionality when you use these, these approximation forwards. You can. There's no guarantee. But how do you actually do the training of the network? And this is what in the machine uh, that brings in the machine learning. And I call this variationally correct residual regression. So what is this? OK, here is here's the question. How to learn this mapping that takes you from the parameter space to the solution space? And when you, when you, when you would like to be a, a machine learner, OK, regression is, 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 is one method of choice when you approximate a function. So what does it mean? OK, you treat the dependent, sorry, treat the dependence on the parameter y as a st stochastic variable. So you say there's a probability space. And I would like to use Monte Carlo sampling so that at least in high dimensions, I can, I can get Monte Carlo rates. Here for the purpose of creating a reduced model, because this surrogate y to u of y is going to be a reduced model. It's not a solver for one equation. It's a reduced model for a family of solutions. That's completely different than using neural networks for solving a single equation, which will never compete with traditional methods. Anyway, so this is the expectation you would like to minimize. The 
other words, you would like to find a neural network that depends on these y such that an expectation is close to the state. Now viewed as a random variable living in this, with support of this uh, solution manifold. And look at this. This, is, this expectation is nothing but a Bochner norm. It's a norm of functions that have values in a Hilbert space, which where the solutions of the PDE live, not in Euclidean space, and are integrable over the parameter space. So let's call it Bochner space. But it's nothing but another way of writing an expectation. So whenever you see this kind of Bochner space, this is an expectation. So what, what do people do? The slop or the, deep, the, the cool deep learner say, oh, oh very simple. I, I do this empirically. In other words, I sample the function at spatial points. Oops. OK. I sample the function at spatial points. I sample it at parameters. And then I, I, I create this mean square risk. And then I minimize over the trainable parameters so that this guy fits this at those sample points. Uh, very natural. This is what machine learners do. OK, this is not good yet because this would mean u is L2, because you are sampling here in, in parameter space. Really, this norm in u is a norm that involves derivatives, like fluxes in, in, in diffusive form. So OK, one step more, you, you, you train it in, you, you, you train it in, in this. In other words, now you're working in a discrete Bochner space. So these are the two spaces that will always be. So this is just the empirical version of this continuous version, which is my ideal. This gives the metric in which I can measure accuracy. OK, so what is, what is, what is the snag in this? This looks good. This has been done actually in quite a few papers. It's called purely data-driven approach. But of course, what you need to do is you have to come up with these functions. Because for each parameter, if this is a function in x, so in other words, for each parameter sample, you have to solve a, a, a PDE. And you have to solve it accurately, because otherwise you are going to estimate something completely off. So this is expensive. The computation of each sample that you need in training is expensive. And if you have to live with uh, Monte Carlo rates, you need many samples. So this is where people come up with a great remedy. And you all know it. I have heard that everybody likes to work with FIN, which, by the way, is crap. But, you <laughs> but, 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 but you'll see, this, it's, it's, it's a good idea. And this idea is actually not new. The whole reduced basis community lives on training on residual. The only difference is they train the residual in the right norm and not in a simple mean square point-wise sampling norm. That's the big difference. OK, this is where the deep learner is kind of sloppy. He says, OK, it's convenient. I can stick it into my code. I can use PyTorch from, uh, from the start. There's no problem. I don't have to think this is going to work. It's not MIOT, Jan. OK, so this is what you would have to do, to minimize a residual, because the rationale is if the real solution makes this residual to zero, then the good idea is to, to train the neural network here, to train it in such a way that the residual sampled at sufficiently many points is going to be small. And then you say, well, if the residual is small, I'm not too far off. Very wrong. But anyway, it's a good hope. All right, we'll see. And as soon as this proposition comes up, here is the stickler. He jumps up. He says, this is nonsense. How can you do this? I mean, nobody can believe that you are, this is impossible. Don't do this. This is never going to work. Well, the deep learner says, well, calm down. Let's see. Well, then the stickler comes up. I tell you why. So we look at a specific example why this is not going to work. Here is our old friend, the diffusion equation. For a numerical analyst, this is about the easiest equation you can give it. Okay? So you do that. Here's my residual. The right hand side, here's the divergence, part, uh, the second order part. And you stick it into this residual. So this is the residual evaluated at spatial points, evaluated at parameter points, squared, summed, boom. And you make sure that the boundary conditions are valid. You, you, you sample the, the neural network on the boundary. You sample again with your parameters, square, minimize. So this is your objective. Yeah, now you can use PyTorch immediately. You can just stick it into 
into your code. But if you look closer, you would say, well, this is supposed to be as the better the more samples you have. Because then you have better information. Now, if you let the sample size talk to infinity, you see that this tends to an L2 norm of the residual. And this tends to an L2 norm of the, of the function on the boundary, a trace norm. Now, everybody who has attended one of the first courses in numerical analysis says this is a variation of prime. Because in many cases, the coefficients here are even piecewise constants. So they are discontinuous. There is no H2 solution. There's no solution whose residual is in L2. This doesn't exist. So you're optimizing a functional that doesn't even have a limit. So if the previous estimation is ill-posed, that this is more ill-posed afterwards. OK? And this is one of the examples that people use. But even worse so with wave propagation, which is another thing. So what, and then the question is, at some point, you stop with your minimization. And now you would like to know, how accurate is my solution now? And I say, you, uh, there's no way to infer from the size of this residual here at the minimum here to the error in this norm. There's just no relation. And in fact, the, uh, the norm for the bulk residual is too strong, and the norm for the trace residual is too weak. Because the trace norm should be h a half. This is for mathematicians. But if you don't do it, you see it in your result. If you take too weak a norm on the trace, you see it in your result. And uh, in a recent paper on data assimilation, actually for parabolic problems, so this is not just for stationary problems, um, you, s you see a clear effect that if you impose too much regularity on an inverse problem, you will, be, uh, you, you will pay big time in, 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 your numeric, in your numerical code. So now here is the Stickler's idea. He says, well, you have to give it to the guy that he's not just nagging and, and complaining. He's coming up with an idea. So what idea is the Stickler, Stickler putting on the table? It says, OK, I like this idea with minimizing residuals. Reduced basis became successful by doing this. Now, let's do it again. But then the function of x and y should be uh, one function of one equation so that you can use that residual. Because otherwise, for each separate y, u of x is the solution of one equation, which depends on y. Then for another y, it's the solution of another equation. So you have to identify one equation so that u is the residual. So then you can use this residual, hopefully, and train it in the right norm. And the emphasis on right norm so that you don't slide into the variation crime of the previous example. So this is the Stickler's idea. And uh, now the question is, OK, what do we have to take into account when we minimize residuals? Is it really so that a small residual says you have a small error? And those who have attended uh, numerical analysis course in mechanical engineering should remember, no. The relation between a residual and the error is the condition of the problem. So in this case, the 2 by 2 matrix behind this linear problem is just almost singular. And the, the smaller that slope, the more it is to be completely uh, singular. So if you want to keep the residual comparable to the error, you need a slope like this. You need a matrix with a much better condition. And that's true. In, I mean, this is not, not a good picture for infinite dimensions, but this is true for operator equations again. So the key to cook up a residual that is so well conditioned so that residuals tell you accuracy about errors is the heart of what comes next. This is what can be subsumed. And in fact, there is a, there's a way to do this for a wide range of PD, including sta uh, non-stationary problems, like parabolic ones or so. But it needs stable variational formulations for these PDEs. And if they are non-stationary, it must be in, in, sp in space and time. This is an emergent topic, by the way, itself. So let's forget about the space, uh, the time now, this distinction. But let's see what the idea is. So this is going to be a hairy slide. So I'll give you a warning. But if you survive this, and if you make a little bit sense of it, I think it gives you something. 
Okay, so what is it? What is that? We start with the solution. Oops. So the solution as a function of y, for each y is a solution to one problem, f of u depending on y. Okay, now the first thing you need a weak formulation. You need to read that that is essential. You need a reformulation. In other words, you multiply that solution, that equation by a test function and, re and require this to be zero for all test functions. And here is essential in which space you seek your solution and for which space you use for your test function. And the choice of this space is the path to a tight residual. That's another way of preconditioning an operator equation. OK, once you have done this, you still have a family of weak problems. But now you simply integrate over the variable. And this is why I chose as a target space, L2 in Y. So there's no derivative acting on Y. So I can, I can use just L2. And integrating out, viewing the parameter as a stochastic variable with respect to a measure, P mu, then you get a single equation, which is obtained by integrating these individual fiber equations. And here pops out, while Previously, the test space for each y was v. Now it's the Bochner space because you have integrated over y. This is the y space. So this is this guy. So now you have a new single variational problem over these Bochner spaces. And I just go through this. doesn't really matter. This, and for linear problems, they look like this. There's a right-hand side, and there's a bilinear form where the test function is here and the trial function is sitting now you ask, well, does this give me a good, what is a good residual representation so that I can infer from it the size of the error? And the answer is a classical theorem. The famous babushka Natchez theorem that should be taught in every numerical analysis course. And it says, under certain assumptions on this bilinear form, the residual is equivalent to L with constants that are given by a continuity inequality and an inner-speed condition. So if you manage to cook up u and v so that x and y satisfy these continuity and inner-speed conditions with constant cb and capital cb, then you have a tight error residual relation. In other words, minimizing this guy will minimize this error. And this is a residual. Okay. And in terms of expectations, it's just described here. And you see, in the continuous ideal scenario, there's a Bochner space. Oh, this is kept. Um, it's, it's a Bochner space with L2 as a function. In the empirical way, where you have only finitely many samples, it's a discrete Bochner space with little L2. So it's a clear sum of those. So, but it's, it's essentially the satisfaction of the in-soup conditions and continuity conditions. And then there's a little thought that shows if you can show this for every fiber problem uniformly, then it holds for these lifted problems on x and y. So if you can show its validity on u and v uniformly, it holds for x and, and, x and y. OK, now you can say, well, this is a typical mathematical By the way, it is. It's, it's, it, I know, it's, it's one of those slides you hate, because they, they give you all sorts of information, but I hope I can, I can, I can distill the spirit of it. It's, it's, it's an important slide, but of course, also the stickler is exhausted after going through the slide. He has, to, he has to push it into this deep learner's throat and say, you have to accept it, otherwise you get trapped. And he's exhausted, so he needs a massage. But the two have a good relation, and the deep learner is willing to give him that massage to, to recover and continue the, and continue the discussion. Okay? So I give you one example where this mechanism you see. Because the question is, well, that's nice. If they satisfy in soup conditions, then you are in business. But how do you make sure they satisfy in soup conditions? In, 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 in elliptic problems, it's trivial. It's just coercivity. But in other problems like transport, it's not. And then you, nev you, you never have coercivity. You have something else, like saddle point stability. 
And here's a simple example. So we'll go back to our transport equation. This is our transport equation. So the first step was go to a weak solution. Weak solution means you multiply the transport equation by a test function and integrate. And then you do something else. You, you use Green's theorem. In other words, you move the derivatives to the test function. Okay, and this is what you get. Now, the, the trial function is free of derivatives. It only is required to live in L2. And transport equations can have shear discontinuity, so it's better to put them in L2 rather than in a Sobolev space of higher order because they won't be there in general. Okay, but now the test function has to be stable under this. Th this has expression has to be in L2, which means that this direction derivatives have to be in L2 uniformly over one. So this is a typical example where the trial space is simple, L2, and the test space is different. And it's chosen in such a way that, in fact, at the end of the day, you have to work, but you can prove the subcondition in Babushka's theorem holds. So you do have a stable residual in this case in the dual norm of this space. Okay, here it is. And, and now you may ask, well, that's a, that's a coincidence. It's a simple case, a very simple case. What is it with more complicated things? Here's kind of a, a road map. And this comes from DPG and discontinuous petrov galerkin methodology. It's being used there all the time. And it has produced stable discretizations for problems that are not stable in, 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 in the classical form. And the way it works is like this. You take your PDE, write it as a first order system. The transport equation was already a first order, so you don't have, you, I didn't need that step here. Now, in the weak formulation now of a first order system, you move the derivatives, one order of derivatives to the, to the test sum. Now you have U actually in, in, in L2, in an L2 space. And what you have to do now is that the adjoint operator, which is, which is this one here, sitting in here, the B star, the operator is adjoint to the original transport operator, that this is bijective between pairs of dense space. That's the analysis work you have to do. I'm, I'm, I'm sweeping that under the rug. That's work. But for instance, in, in, in the above case, that could be done. And in many other cases, where you'll see all these in the DPG literature, you could be do it. And then you have a test norm. It's induced by the adjoint operator measured in the dual norm of u. But now you say, well, the dual norm of u I can't compute. Well, this is when you have a weak, when u is L2. Then the dual norm equals u. So this is now computable. Now we have a pair of test and trial metrics which you can use in such a way that residuals are equivalent to L's. Now, of course, the idea is you train on these residuals. Because then you know when you stop training this residual, the size of the residual is the size of the error. And you have an, error, an accuracy quantification by doing this. Well, of course, there's a wrinkle. What is that wrinkle here? And that brings me back to my original slides created by, by my son. Well, the residual is measured. In order to have all this, the residual is minimized in this norm, in the dual norm. So that is the dual norm of this space. And that dual norm is also easy to write because L2 is self-dual in this variable. You don't have to do anything here, but here you need the dual norm in, in B. And that's typically a non-trivial dual norm. It's this graph norm in the, in, in, in the transport equation. So how do you evaluate dual norms? And that's the key. In, so that's the price you pay. You sort of create a training objective so that when you minimize it, you actually know what your accuracy of your neural network is. And the price you pay, the objective function you would like to minimize, is not so easy to, easy to evaluate because it's a dual norm. Why is that not so easy to evaluate? Here's the reason. A dual norm, by its definition, is a supreme, is a supreme, is a supremization over Hilbert space in this case over Bana space in general. <coughs> you see? In other words, in order to determine the value of this, which you would like to decrease, say, by a gradient method on the parameters sitting in this guy, well, this quantity is the supremization over a test function in Y, which is an infinite dimensional space. 
No, that's not possible. Okay. But the pragmatic guy kicks in and says, well, we'll find an a way. So basically what you do, you minimize over this n, and you supermise over this test function. So this is a min-max problem. Okay? Min-max problem. Then you do alternatively a minimization and a maximization. And you keep going. And hope that you, 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 you turn to the right thing. Yeah, so this is what the deep learner says. How about iteratively computing such a, such a quantity? So now I have changed from n to g, because this is becoming now my generative network. And now I have to make sure that the choice of my g that should minimize this norm is controlled by the adversarial network, which plays the role of the test function. And what people do is they fix a budget or an architecture for the adversarial network, and they fix an architecture for the generative network, and then they go. Minimize, maximize, minimize, maximize, each time a gradient step. Okay? And this has been done with moderate success for special PDEs, actually not seeing that this is a general context. And this simple in uh, this is Babushka Natchez theorem tells you the scope where this is possible. So they did it for elliptic and for Friedrich system, which are special cases for which Babushka's theorem also, also gets gets in, and then, of course, the stick like that up and says, no, no, come on, this is not going to work. I tell you, this will never fly. And uh, the deep learner says, why? Uh, this is, sounds to me like a good idea. No, 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 the, the stick like says, this is an awkward quotient, and you don't know how many uh, iterations you need in each direction, and you don't know whether you can actually be accurate enough in your test. Because being not accurate enough in the supermanization means you are minimizing the wrong norm. And then you are creating crap. Then you are back to what you did before. OK, so this is what the stickler says. Everybody knows in reduced basis that the dual norm is actually the same as applying the functional under this norm to a, a particular test function, which is the, the peak function. This is the test function that realizes the dual norm. Well, OK, that's fine. A mathematician likes that. But this test function happens to be a solution of a, of, of a variational problem. And this variational problem is, by definition, always elliptic. So this is always a nice problem. And since it is an elliptic problem, it is the minimizer itself of an energy. OK, what does that buy us? Well. Now you can play the game of applying this condition as a Lagrange multiplier in a minimization of basically this thing. And then use duality. And use the fact that on the Hilbert spaces, there's no duality gap, and turn to the dual problem. And the dual problem, in the end, looks like this. So you still have a max-min problem. But the quantities are much more benign. It's not these quotients. The quantities are more benign because they involve only an affine functional and a quadratic function on the Hilbert space level. Okay. So, and this is what we are currently doing, and it shows much better, much better results. But here we also use the fact that the peak function is a solution of this PDE, and we use a posteriori criteria to tell whether this solution is good enough. And what it means is this has to be close to the maximizer with an ac relative accuracy. And if you don't do that, you veer off into, in, in, into something else. And uh, I skip this because one other, the message is once you know how to deal with these dual norms, you can cook up these problems for parameter or state estimation. We, we won't have time to read it. So, but I would like to close with a few words on optimization because that now becomes crucial. As I already said, if you are not able to, to find a good enough approximation to the adversarial network with just the Reese lift in this variational problem, it's the solution of the PDE itself. If you don't do that, you optimize the wrong functional. And then, of course, you get nothing where you have an error qualification at all. So optimization plays a major role now. So this is what you do in the end. Instead of this quotient, you can do this. 
And we are cooking up sort of a general framework for optimizing such obs obs observations, which has all the same structure. Namely, they are affine functionals or quadratic functionals. The difficulty, these, these are very simple problems. If you, if, you have, if you have such functionals that you stick in a B spline, it's a very simple optimization problem because it's convex. Now, you lose convexity only because your neural networks are nonlinear. So the situation is you, are, you have a nice objective functional, but you stick in some highly nonlinear Bs, and they make the optimization problem ugly because you lose convexity. Big time, actually. Five more points, I will do it. Oh, I'm getting close. It's only junk. Okay. So, uh, in other words, one has to make sure in, in, in an iterative scheme to realize this relative action scheme. And it necessitates adapting network. Even if you fix a, a budget for your generative network, you have to adjust the adversarial network because otherwise you will not be able to realize this. So there's an interesting research field, namely network adaptation. And here I think it plays, it, it, it plays an enabling role. And this is, I, I'm not going to show you now, this was this video from before where this was going from, from coarse to fine. You can also use nested iteration. In other words, the maximization over the adversarial network, you shouldn't do that on the full Hilbert space. You should start with a small problem where the relative accuracy is very coarse, where the, the optimization goal is easier to achieve, you have an initial guess for the next larger model, and so on. So you keep increasing the models in an iterative, in a nested refinement way, and this gives you convergence where otherwi otherwise the scheme would, 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 would drop out. And it's particularly nice in this case when you use ultra-weak formulations. One of the descent steps, you can actually compute the ideal descent direction analytically. And you could use uh, a direct supervised learning to approximate that rather than relying on stochastic gradients. So it opens a whole broad park of possibilities to, to, to improve on the, on the optimization. Uh, and the final idea is since you're always in this situation, there's a, a, a functional living on a Hilbert space, and you would and it, it, the difficulty is only because you stick something very nonlinear into it. And now you can say, well, the best would be in the Hilbert space, the op optimization is trivial. You are minimizing a bowl. The gradient descent in the Hilbert space would be very quickly converging. Only you can't compute in the Hilbert space because it's infinite dimensional. So network adaptation now means in each step you try to adapt the network so as to come close to the optimal descent direction. And that can be done computationally. So this is, um, without this network adaptation, it's just a successive expansion of the network upon need, which shows that you already get, and this, is, this was an application, I don't have time to go into it, but this shows that your generalization error is in the end significantly smaller than without it and starting from scratch with a huge network and just optimizing the hell out of it. So, uh, and here is this idea I said, well, in the Hilbert space, the, the, the problem is easy. You, you minimize, you slide down the ball. So as soon as you stick the network in, you get a terror landscape, error landscape. But now you try to push this network in such a way that here you are closer, you can approximate this direction better. And this actually, even in a crude, preliminary way works works very well. So this is, it gives you a smaller generalization error than before. But then, oh wait, good lord, the deep learner says, do I need all this? I mean, my stochastic gradient descent is such a nice thing to do. I would like to, to hit it all the time with the same thing. And okay, so this is the dispute. Should we do this? The dispute is going on. The, the, these don't they, they don't get to any kind of ag agreement. And then somebody says, maybe we need, uh, we need an advice from a competent mediator. And after all, we are gathering in his, in, in his name. And what is he going to say? He says, well, PDEs and optimization for a mathematician is an interesting field. Okay? It's, it's a different point of view. 
Maybe, maybe there's something to be gained in the end, in particular for nonlinear problems. This is, this is the hint for those who desperately want to ask a question. But, uh, and then mathematics can unveil the underlying mechanism. They, they, it can identify what are the issues. Why is it working in some cases? Why is it not working in other cases? And then you may find remedies. So this is a pledge to the student. Don't dismiss this. Don't avoid the hard thinking at the beginning. It usually pays off. And so the end is there's no free lunch. If you, if you want to be predict predictive in your engineering application, there's no free lunch. You, there is something you have to give to the stickler, and rather than just tweaking your code. And uh, these are all questions that are being also discussed in the new SFD of the mathematics department, which is, which was just uh, decided last spring. And we're all happy to, happy to have. Thank you. I'm almost in time, right? <laughs>